Now, with a view to the guidance of God and his blessing, let's turn then to Revelation chapter 3 again and the letter to the church in Philadelphia, which we have recorded from verse 7 down to verse 13. And in verse 13, this letter, like all the letters, ends with the exhortation, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And in a sense, that's functioning as our text, governing the way we hear all the seven letters. We must make sure that we have an ear to really hear what God is communicating to the visible church, the church on earth, through these letters. But although that's a general text, I think it's only right to take a more specific text, which we have really at the heart of the letter in verse 8, where Christ says to the church, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. These letters you remember, are dictated by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to the Apostle John. He is at this point in a small island called Patmos, which is just off western Turkey, Asia Minor, and he's exiled there because he is an apostle, a preacher of God's word. We are in the context of the first persecution of the church under the emperor Nero in the AD 60s, just very shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. John sees this vision of the risen Christ on the Lord's day. And he records the vision, and these seven letters especially, he sends them by the hand of a messenger who arrives in Ephesus and makes his way through all these cities, delivering to the church the letter that Christ once delivered to it. So, of course, when these churches gather on the Lord's Day themselves, in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and so on, the minister, instead of reading the scripture that he would normally read, which is the Old Testament scrolls, plus the New Testament as it was being written, he receives a fresh and final revelation from John the Apostle, the last word from our Lord Jesus Christ, the last scripture that he has given us. And so it's important to remind yourself that these believers here, for example, in Philadelphia, would be sitting, assembled for worship like you are, and the announcement is made that there is a direct letter from Christ to themselves. You can imagine the way in which that would change their hearing. But I think we always have to make the effort, as we're listening all along, to recognize that these seven letters represent the full state of the Christian church in various parts of the world at any given time. And we must always give ear to see if the particular message is for ourselves. We will fall into the description of one of these churches at any given time, and that's through individually as well as corporately. And wouldn't you pray with myself, that the Lord would give us an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice, to each individual church, he tells them to make sure that they hear what the Spirit says to the church is plural, because the condition of the church, of course, may change. And a church like this, Philadelphia, may decline unless it keeps pursuing the Lord as it should. So then, after leaving Sardis, the messenger makes his way just about 30 miles southeast until he comes to this town of Philadelphia, which means in the Greek, brotherly love. But I don't think that has anything to do with the letter that follows. This is the youngest city by far of the seven cities that we encounter in Asia Minor. And like modern cities today, it was a planned city rather than a city that grew. Cities that are planned, I suppose, look different. Most cities, ancient cities, just grow. Uh, British cities are like that. Uh, They tend just to grow, and that's why they sprawl in the way that they do. Whereas if you go to somewhere like, say, Phoenix in Arizona, it's absolutely planned from scratch, so they look very different. And Philadelphia looks different in that way. 
And instead of just growing like that, it was planted, but it was planted, like most things that are planted, it was planted for a purpose. It was very strategically placed at the intersection between three ancient kingdoms, Lydia, Mycia, and Phrygia. And there was a particular reason for putting it there. It was meant to be a city that would carry Greek culture into these ancient kingdoms so that they would become thoroughly Grecianized or Hellenized, if you want a more technical term. So, in a sense, it was a missionary city for Greek culture. You'll notice that that may have very special reference to the kind of letter that Jesus writes to the city. It was also, incidentally, just a precarious place to live uh, because it was situated on a, a fault, a geological fault. There are many cities like that in the world today. You wonder actually why people live in them. You wonder why people live on the sides of volcanoes or why people live in cities that are so near to major fault lines in the Earth's geology. Well, Philadelphia was like that. And in fact, it seems to be the case that most people who lived there had another kind of emergency house that wasn't too far away. And it wasn't unusual for them to have to flee the city because of a larger tremor than usual. So they were used to tremors, they were used to shocks, and now and again there would be a pretty catastrophic earthquake. That too, I think, will be significant as we go through the letter. But as usual, what matters most in connection with these cities is that the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is there. That's what matters most. Founded again, like all the churches in Asia Minor, founded by the Apostle Paul, when he preached in Ephesus, which was the functional headquarters of the whole area. And the thing is that whatever you may say about the city and whatever it's like, the most important thing about it is that the Church of Christ is there. And really the eternal destiny of all the inhabitants of Philadelphia has something to do with how they respond to the Church of Christ there. If you walk through the streets of Philadelphia and said, what's the most important building here? They would possibly point out one of the temples or shrines or the public library or the public baths or whatever, I mean, or the courts of law. I mean, who would actually point to perhaps a large house where the Church of Christ gathered? Or perhaps if they had a building of their own, who would have pointed to it and said it was the most significant? But our Lord teaches us in Matthew 25 that inasmuch as we do this or don't do this to the least of the brethren of Jesus Christ, well, so we stand or fall. We will either hear the words, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and for his angels, or hear the words, Come, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world, depending on how we respond to Christ present on the earth, in his church, and speaking through his church. Few people in party probably would say that this is the most important building in party. I shouldn't put it that. I know that I'm conscious there are other churches here too, but I'm talking just ecclesiastically here. Few would say that this is the most important building in party. But yet where the church of Jesus Christ is established, it becomes the most important and significant thing. And for you, the most important building is that. The most important message is the word of God, not the news, but the good news. And how we respond to it determines whether we are in heaven or whether we are in hell. The pattern of the letter is the same as the rest. After the greeting and the brief uh, introductory description of Christ himself, you'll notice he introduces himself in a slightly different way according to the church that he's writing to. After that, you have a commendation, you have a criticism, you have a counsel based on the criticism, and that's followed by a promise to those who respond and who overcome, and then the exhortation to make sure that they hear and that they listen well. So let's turn to what our Lord has to say. And we can begin with a commendation, but it's as well before we begin with the commendation to point out that there's no censure, there's no word of rebuke. Like Smyrna, this church is clean. This church is pure. This church is right and good in the sight of the Lord. That doesn't mean that she's perfect. 
People use the cliche a lot, there's no perfect church, and they say that to allow any kind of thing to go on in church. It doesn't matter how evil it is. And If you point it out, they say, oh, but there's no perfect church. Well, we know there's no perfect church. That is true. Smyrna itself was no perfect church. This church is no perfect church. It's got sinners in it. They've got infirmities, all these sinners. Not everything is absolutely perfectly holy. But the fact is that, like Smyrna, the church in Philadelphia was keeping to apostolic doctrine, apostolic worship, and apostolic government. She was doing that. The Lord doesn't have to turn around and censure her and warn her because of her deviation from doctrine, worship, or government. Because of that, he doesn't have to threaten her that he will remove the candlestick take away the light of God's word, or that he will visit with chastisement, or visit with death, as he warns the other churches. This is what the reformers would call a pure church. You sometimes find, you know, if you're, if you're ever reading Reformation literature and Reformation in the seven, uh, literature in the 17th century, you'll find people referring to a pure church and the importance of a church being pure. And you see today people respond and say, you can't have a pure church. That's because you don't understand what these writers mean. By a pure church, these writers don't mean a perfect church. They mean a church that adheres to biblical worship, doctrine, and government. And in the same connection, you know when we use the expression purity of worship, we we refer that expression to the fact that we sing the word of God alone as he has appointed it. When we use the expression purity of worship there, we don't mean to convey by that that our worship is absolutely pure in the sight of God. The sin in your heart is enough is enough to remind you that your worship will not be absolutely pure in the sight of God. The expression purity of worship there is to be understood like the expression the purity of the church. It adheres externally to exactly what the Lord has commanded us. And therefore, we can be sure that the Lord will not visit us with his wrath on account of deviating from that. So that's what we mean by purity of worship. Not that our worship is perfectly pure, but that it's pure in its form as God gave it. Now, that's really a blessed condition for this church to be in, and Smyrna too. It would be a marvelous thing if the Lord came to us here today and said to us as a congregation that He only has words of commendation for us and words of encouragement and not words of censure. A marvelous thing if he could say the same thing about you too, that in spite of your infirmities in thought, word, and deed, that I am pleased with you. I am pleased with you. You have a little strength, but you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. You are obedient. You are faithful to me. And you'll notice how this faithfulness that the church has in Philadelphia is commended by the Lord. He makes a special commendation of it, and he actually rewards the faithfulness too by giving them a special opportunity. That, by the way, is the way God works. I'm sure you've seen it in your own life that if in some way you are faithful to him, if there is a particular test of your allegiance or something of that kind, and if you stand the test... He will show you his pleasure, his satisfaction, and he will do it by giving you a special opportunity of some kind to prove yourself even more. I'll come come to that in a second. But let me just first of all focus with you on the faithfulness being commended. In verse 8, he says to the church, at the end of the verse, you have a little strength. I think we should translate or understand that. Although you have a little strength, you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Verse 10, and the first part of verse 10, you have kept my command to persevere. So we can put these three little bits together from the end of verse 8 and the beginning of verse 10. You have kept my word, you have kept my word to persevere, and you have not denied my name. Now, these are beautiful things to say too. First of all, you have kept my word. That meant essentially that 
they had been obedient. When God gives us his word to keep, it usually means that we are obedient to the precept inside it. There is a command of some kind inside his word, and it's our duty to keep it. But, of course, it's a little bit wider than just being obedient. To keep God's word is a kind of process. And I would describe it to you like this. The first part of keeping God's word is to receive it. Of course, it comes through the ear. Take heed how you hear. But you receive it through the ear, of course. But the first part to keeping it is receiving it into the heart. The second part is uh, laying it up in your heart. As the word keep often means to observe it. Think about it. Pray over it. And last of all, you practice it in your life. So you receive it by faith. You observe it. You nurture it. You meditate over it. And you practice it in your life. And the Lord is saying to these Philadelphians that they have done that. They're good listeners. They're good observers of the Word of God. And they are good at practicing the word of God. James, of course, warns us against being hearers of the word and not being doers of it. Well, you can't say that of these people. Can you say that of yourself too? I mean, keeping God's word, do you keep his word? Do you think of that merely in terms of keeping his commandments or keeping them externally? Well, you begin to keep God's word by hearing it properly, taking it in, thinking about it prayerfully and practicing it in your life. The special commandment that he commends them for observing is the command to persevere in verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. God, of course, tells us to do that. He tells us to keep on, keep on going, keep on obeying, keep on working out the word of God in your life. Keep on hearing, keep on observing, Keep on practicing. Persevere. That, of course, brings before us that there must have been some kind of special pressure on the Philadelphians to do otherwise. I suppose there always is. But sometimes there can be a very special pressure to do otherwise. And that's obviously the case here because he commends them for not denying my name. You have a little strength, he says, you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. You have kept my command to persevere. You did that without denying. And it seems to be the case that just like the church in Smyrna, the pressure to deny was coming from the Jews again. You'll notice, by the way, that John, for a second time, doesn't really want to call them Jews. uh, Because anyone who's opposed to God is not a true Jew. As Paul reminds us, a true Jew is one who is a Jew inwardly whose circumcision is not external and fleshly, but inwardly in the heart. And essentially, he's saying, if if these were true Jews who were persecuting you, they would be recognizing you, and they would be recognizing your Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But sadly, their synagogue has descended into a synagogue of Satan, a meeting place of opposition to the God whom they profess. A very, very sad thing. But in the face of all this opposition that they're getting in Philadelphia, they are persevering in obedience, and they are not denying Jesus' name. Now, I think not denying the name means just that they confess him. In their speech, they still talk about him, they still praise him, they still gather, they exalt his great and glorious name, and neither do they deny him in their conduct. When the pressure is on in relation to the Sabbath or their jobs, things that we saw already in previous letters, sometimes it was very, very difficult to be a consistent Christian in these uh, towns, in these cities. You could lose your job. Uh, Many privileges would be denied you by confessing Christ. Well, they confessed. And all that, you see, is in spite of the fact that they have just a little strength. You have a little strength Now, it's not actually easy to understand exactly what that's referring to. At least, to be honest, it's not for me. I don't think it's a reference to spiritual strength. Because why would you 
commend people for just having a little spiritual strength? Why have no word of censure if their strength is so small? I think the strength must be a reference to something else. It it must be a reference to the way that uh, they have a certain kind of status in the community or their influence or their numbers, something like that. He's essentially saying to them, look, you don't have influence in that city as the world looks at influence. You don't have significance. People can walk up and down in Philadelphia and not care about you. They can ignore you. They possibly don't even know you're there. And God says, I know that. I know that. In in worldly terms and in worldly reckoning, your strength is small. But, he says, not really. Because the things that constitute true strength, you have in abundance. The things that make you strong in my sight, spiritual strength, you have it. You haven't denied me. You've stayed loyal and true, and you are persevering in the faith. I think that in itself can be encouraging for people like ourselves. The Reformed cause is so weak. Those who really profess Reformation doctrine, worship, and government seem so small, even in this country, that once actually swore to these things. You'll remember that? Our nation actually covenanted from the king and the parliament down to the common people to preserve our doctrine, our worship, and our government. And now the numbers that keep to it and know why they're keeping to it and love it is nearly insignificant. People can ignore us. I mean, people could walk up and down the streets of Gardner Street here or other churches that adhere to this form of worship too, and there are others on this form of doctrine and government. They can walk past them, and they haven't a clue what goes on in there. Sometimes that's our fault, but a lot of the time it's not our fault. They just don't want to know, and they don't care. Insignificant is how we can feel, and insignificant is how the world considers us. But you see, God knows. God knows. You have a little strength there, he says. But I know that you haven't denied my name. And I know that you've kept my word. And I know that you are persevering. And when we do that, God honors it. He honors it. And he honors it here. Because you'll notice this open door of verse 8 has a direct relationship to the fact that they have been obedient and faithful. Look at the way the sentence is structured. Verse 8, I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for or because you have a little strength, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I have set before you an open door. In other words, you've defended You've kept, you've preserved, and now I'm giving you an opportunity to advance and to move forward. You've shown that you can be a steward. Well, as a steward, I will open the door for you, and nobody can shut it. You have kept and preserved the stewardship of my word and faithfulness to my truth, so I will open to you a door now through which I am calling you to pass. He wants us to step through this door. I have set it before you. In fact, that expression, I have set before you an open door, is a Greek word which means really to entrust. It's always used of stewardship, and you'll notice the theme of stewardship here anyway. You have it in verse 7. These things say, see who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. That is a reference to the steward that we read of in Isaiah 22. The steward was a a distinctive person, a very important person in the royal household. He had to be absolutely trustworthy because the king could more or less commit all issues of access into his presence and um, the distribution of palace goods and so on. All that was in his hand. And the sign, the symbol of his office was a key on his shoulder. This was the key to the royal house. And here we're introduced to the one, the Lord Jesus, who has the key of David. And when he opens, no one shuts. And when he shuts, 
no one opens. And so it's the same kind of theme that you have in verse 8 where he says, see, I have set before you an open door. The word for set here is to entrust. It's the kind of word you would use if you were giving a sum of money to someone to look after on your behalf. I've commissioned you with an open door. In other words, you see, we'll see in a minute that this means an opportunity of some kind. But what this this is telling us is that every opportunity God gives is actually a responsibility. When God gives you an opportunity to do something, he's giving you a responsibility to do that thing at the same time. Um, That reminds us that we just move from test to test, in a sense, in our Christian lives. God says, you've done that, and you did it well, so here's an opportunity to do this. And when I'm giving you an opportunity to do this, I'm giving you a responsibility now to do this well too. So you move on all the time, and you move on by God's grace faithfully, showing more faithfulness the greater the sphere of service that God may choose to give you. So I have set before you an open door. Now, what is the open door? Well, the open door is obviously a special opportunity of some kind. And if you look through all the references to open and shut doors in the New Testament, you'll find uh, four or five of them, you'll find that they all have to do with having an opportunity to bring the good news of the gospel to others. That's what they all have to do with. So God is going to give this church that is so small and insignificant, he's going to give it an opportunity to have some kind of major interaction with the people of Philadelphia in a way that they haven't experienced hitherto. It's like God saying, right, you did this well, so now I'm giving you this opportunity. The door that's been closed to you hitherto, you've just got little strength, insignificance, and whatever, you're not known, well, no, you shall be. And it's at this point, you see, that the, that the interesting location of Philadelphia becomes significant. You'll remember that it's the only city here that is planted. It was planted, it was founded by the king of Pergamos, and its strategy was to, to bring Greek culture, you'll remember, to the three ancient kingdoms of Mycenae, Lydia, and Phrygia. So it's it's a missionary city for Greek culture. And God is saying, right, now you will be a missionary congregation to the city in which God has placed you, and I'm giving you an open door to do that in. Let me just refer briefly, just to, uh, to satisfy yourselves and myself too, to the other instances where open doors are referred to. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. If you're taking notes, just take the reference to the note itself. I'm not going to turn to it. You can perhaps look it up later. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul says to the Corinthian church that, I want to go, he says, and I want to visit you, and God willing, I will. But he says, for now, I am staying in Ephesus because a wide and effective door has opened to me. I'm staying in Ephesus, he says, because a wide and effective door has opened to me. Now, you'll notice that he's not always conscious of a spectacular guidance from God on these issues. He's saying to the Corinthians, I'm going. He says, I intend to go, and I go next year if God permits. He hasn't said God's told him to go. He says, I intend to go. And if God permits, he says, I will. I will go. But I'm staying because I am conscious that God has opened a wide and effective door of service to me in Ephesus. Now, the fact is that he stayed three years in Ephesus. That's all. It's not really a long time. So he was conscious that the door was open that long. And I want you to think about that for a second, because when he says that a great and wide door has opened for me in Ephesus, I want you to remember that these seven churches were planted from Ephesus. Remember that. So these cities of Smyrna and Pergamos and Philadelphia and Laodicea and Thyatira and Smyrna, these cities all received the gospel because Paul was three years in Ephesus. That's the great and wide door that was open. So it means an opportunity to preach and some kind of sense with it 
that there is point and purpose in doing so. In other words, there is some kind of response. There is something going on. Maybe it's even, as uh, Samuel says, the sound of a going in the top of the mulberry trees, the book of Samuel. Some kind of indication that God wants it preached there. Some kind of response. Some kind of liberty in doing so. Not just the fact that he's politically free to preach it, but there's something there. And he says, there's a door open here. And I'm staying here until God calls it otherwise. By the way, he actually says, when he says that I am staying in Ephesus because a wide and effective door has opened, he immediately adds, and there are many enemies. Uh, The reason I'm drawing your attention to that is because we would normally take the presence of enemies as a sign that the door shut. But he didn't take it as a sign that the door was shut at all. If there was liberty in proclamation, if there was opportunity to proclaim, then he says, doors open as far as I'm concerned. The the mere presence of opposition is never an indication that the door shut. And there may be many times when God is asking yourself to do something, and sometimes you're put off by a bit of opposition. Well, don't be put off by a bit of opposition. That'll be there. That's no sign that the door is shut. The second instance is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, where Paul tells us that a door of opportunity opened for him in Troas for preaching the gospel. Same thing. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul interestingly prays, well, he asks the saints, he's writing to the Christians in Colossae, he, he says to them, uh, listen to this, he says, Pray for us that God would open a door for the word. So he is conscious wherever he is at that point that he hasn't got an open door. And he's praying and he's asking the people of God to pray that God would open the door there. I would guess that if the door is not opening, if it's not going to open, uh, he will move on elsewhere. And he'll do that because God will open a door elsewhere. That's the way these things happen. I'll come to that in a second, but just generally let me say to you just now that really it's quite evident, even from these texts, that an open door is just an opportunity to do the Lord's work with some kind of encouragement in it to continue. So it's an opportunity, an external opportunity to do it, along with some kind of spiritual encouragement to continue. And the same thing is true on a private level. You'll be looking, I hope, for open doors in your own life, something to do for God, an opportunity to serve, to witness. And you will be sensitive, I hope, to God opening and shutting doors. And uh, it's important to know when God is actually opening and shutting doors for yourself. And before I move on to some of the indications as to whether doors are open or shut, I I want you to notice that sometimes doors are shut. We have this mysterious statement by Paul in Acts 16.6 where he says that he tried to go to Asia with the gospel, but he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. So that's strange because you would have said, you know, that the history of the world would have been so radically different if Paul had gone to Asia with the gospel. He had gone to Asia with the gospel. And he tried to go to Asia, but he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. God said, no. He also says when he tried to go to Bithynia, that uh, he was hindered by God, that the Spirit forbade him to go to Bithynia. So he was conscious sometimes that he was stopped. He was stopped. So he, he would have an intention himself. He would have a purpose, like we all do in life, we plan, in our own prayerful life we plan, and we think this is the way, and then something happened, doors shut, and along with the doors shut, it was made plain to him in his spirit that, no, this is not for me. And and part of what helps you see that is that another door opens at the same time. For example, uh, when Paul was in Troas, and he had a sense that things were finishing, a door opened to him in Macedonia. He saw a vision, you remember, of a man beckoning him over and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And he knew that there was an open door in Macedonia. So he left Troas and off he went to Greece 
and he brought the gospel into Greece. So sometimes doors are shut too. Now, what can we say about all that? Well, there's a lot that could be said. In a way, we could spend weeks and weeks on it. But let's remember, first of all, that true spiritual opportunities are always from God. Christ has the keys of the house of David. In Revelation 1, we're told that he has the keys of death and of hell. Keys of the first death, keys of the second death. It's him that calls you out of time into eternity. It is him that either brings you into heaven or casts you into hell. The keys of these places, the keys of heaven, the keys of hell, the keys of life and death are in his hand. He has the stewardship. And when he opens, nobody can shut a door when God opens it. And when God closes a door, nobody can open it. It's that real, you see. God makes spiritual opportunities, and God shuts them off. God does. And, and we've got to be sensitive to that, and that's the second thing. It's not just the case that God makes the opportunities, but we need the spiritual discernment ourselves to know when a door is open and when a door is shut. And I think if you are spiritually close to God, as you should be, if you're in the Word of God, if you're in prayer, if you're obedient, the open and the shut door will become more and more plain. Friends, the reality is that I've I've got little encouragement, in a way, in terms of guidance to give you and to give me if we're out of step with God. The fact is that you only ever really know what God wants you to do when you're obedient to God. When you're disobedient, it just doesn't happen. You've got difficulty. You can't detect his voice from the myriads of voices that are shouting in your ear all day long. You need prayer, the keeping of the word, persevering in your life and obedience. And when you give that to God, you'll start to recognize the open and shut door. You need to be in the Spirit. And, of course, you need to know that you can't open a door when Christ has shut it. This is relevant in so many different ways. Um, Shut doors, I mean, sometimes even witnessing in your own family, the door can be shut for you, can be shut And the great mistake you make is that you think you can kick that door down. And I've come across instances where I honestly feel that sometimes the parents are too heavy, too heavy on their their teenage or early 20s children in terms of getting them to to do what's right. Too, Too heavy. Sometimes you have to, you've always got to kind of prod. There's no doubt about that. You've always got to make your position known. You've always got to stay constant, true, and faithful for yourself. But you, you can't harass and harangue all the time because it's counterproductive. It's counterproductive. There's just no two ways about that. You need the wisdom of God to know when to say something. When he, when he opens the door, you need, you need to know that God has opened it a chink. And if it's shut, well, it's just counterproductive. God opens the door. Um, and, and that takes me to this, you see, that only prayer, um, sometimes prayer alone is, is your weapon. It's your only weapon. Sometimes it reaches a point where you can't say anything. You pretty much can't say anything. But you can say something to God. You can say, Lord, how I wish this door were open. And I'm praying that you would give me an open door in the heart of my wife in the heart of my husband, in the heart of my son or my daughter, Lord, will you not open this door? And you can shout at your husband and shout at your wife or shout at your daughter, and that won't open a door. But seizing the kingdom of heaven by violence, that may open the door, and you'll recognize when the door has opened. There there will be an opportunity to speak there will be an opportunity, and there will be some kind of response. This sensitivity to open and shut doors is something we need all the time. After all, God will always open doors if we ask him to. 
Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. We want an open door. We want it. We want an open door. People coming in here, we want an open door for ourselves to go out. We want a door of opportunity to evangelize. We want a door of opportunity in the hearts of people in Muir Park and Gardner Street and White Street and elsewhere. We want a door of opportunity there. Uh, we feel perhaps that by the grace of God we have something like other churches too that they wish to communicate. We have the truth of God. We have the worship of God's glorious name. We wish to bring that to bear on the lives of others. Now God has given us in a sense a door by giving us this place, has he not? He's given us a door of opportunity there. We need also to pray for doors to open in the hearts of people out there so that when we knock on their door or when we bring them here for something shortly, as we hope by the grace of God to do, there will be a ready people, a people with ears, a people who will be receptive to whatever it is by the grace of God that he'll give us to say prayer opens doors. Prayer opens doors. And I want you to notice, too, that God's going to help them with this open door by giving them peace. He's actually going to preserve them from an hour of temptation that is going to come upon the world. Now, I think world is to be understood there in a narrower sense than the whole cosmos or the whole inhabited earth. Sometimes, if you notice, for example, Luke 2, chapter, verse 1, where we're told that the decree went forth from Caesar Augustus that the world should be taxed, China wasn't taxed. You understand that? Asia wasn't taxed. It's a reference to the Roman world. And sometimes we have to understand the world in a slightly lesser sense. You can tell. You can tell when, the Bible, when texts are written normally which world is being referred to. It's quite clear. But there's a, there's a particular trial coming upon the Roman world, and it's a reference to the hostility of, of the emperor. But he says, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to give you a special kind of protection because I want you to prosecute the mission that you've got. And sometimes God does that. He just creates this little kind of bubble in which you can work and function because he wants you to, and he's giving you that opportunity, and he wants you to be faithful inside it. And in fact, in fact he tells them that this Jewish community is going to be changed I will make those, verse 9, of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. The word worship there is the more general word which means to fall down in prostration. Some have gone to great lengths to say that they are worshipping God before your feet. But, uh, you know, worship can mean to do obeisance sometimes, the Greek word used here. And I think that's it, the Arca. The, the Old Testament gives us a vision in one place of the Gentile world recognizing that God is with the Jew. But then, you see, it gives us the vision that the Jewish world will one day recognize that God is with the Gentile. And that's what you've got here. It's the Jew saying, God is with you. We've given you a hard time and we've persecuted, but we now understand that God is with you. And that's God saying, see, if you walk through the open door, that I've set before you, I will reward you. There will be fruit for your labors, and those who are hostile to you will come and acknowledge that God has been with you all along. Last of all, and I'm only just mentioning this, and one of the reasons I'm only mentioning it is because some of the material is duplicated in the letters. For example, this is going to mention a new name. I, I've said what the new name means in the letter. Uh, to Pergamos. So there's no real need for me to enter more fully into that. So I'll, I'll just very, very quickly say a word about the promise. This closes with a promise. Verse 12, the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my new name. Pillars, we're led here to the spiritual temple that God is assembling in heaven. As he's bringing his saints home to heaven, he is assembling a spiritual temple. And he says, when you overcome, he says, I will make you pillars in that temple. The image is just security and permanence. And prominent pillars and buildings in the ancient past used to have special things written on them. There are things written on these pillars, and they have to do with, to do with names, 
possessions. The name of God is going to be on you. The name of the new Jerusalem, you belong to it. You're a city, you're a citizen of this new city. And the new name that God is giving you, these things are going to be written on you. The image is safety, stability, and strength. You know, the Old Testament temple had two massive pillars, Jachin and Boaz. And, and they meant something. One meant God will establish, and the other meant in it is strength. And, uh, you know, it, it's like that pillar, strength. God is our strength. God will make us strong, and he will make us strong and secure in the temple above. We will be known there as belonging to him. We will be strong there. And it says that you will no more go out and come in. Is that a reference to the fact that they were always so insecure? Just It was either A.D. 17 or 19 when an earthquake pretty much destroyed the city yet again. And they had to rebuild, and everything they had was so uncertain. And if there was a bad tremor, off they went to their small houses, which were outside the city. He's presenting an image of security. He says, when you're in my house, you're in my house forever, and no one will ever take you out of there. You're you're kept by my strength, and you're kept by my power. I give you these things. I make you strong in the church in this world, and I will make you strong in my house above. You'll be a pillar in the house of God, a pillar forevermore. And Christ, of course, has the key, and he shuts the door of heaven. Yes, solemnly, friends, he shuts the door of heaven. You have the image in Matthew 25 of the virgins trying to get in, and they are exiled. They are banished to the outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth, which also has a lock and which also has a key. As C.S. Lewis famously said, we locked that door inside ourselves first. Yes, we bolted it on ourselves from the inside because we choose hell. But in the last analysis, the outer door is bolted by the Lord Jesus Christ too. And I want you to remember that really um, the door that's open before some of you here today is not a door of service or opportunity. Well, an opportunity in one way because it's the gospel door, is it not? The straight gate, the narrow gate. It's flung wide open. God has set it wide open, the gate of righteousness. But it's narrow. You can't take all your rubbish in with you. By repentance, you must enter it. That's the open door that God has shut before you in the gospel. You've got to walk through that one first. And you need to because the day will come when it's fast bolted shut. Let's pray. Gracious, merciful God, in your sovereign grace and mercy, be pleased to present before us a gate that is open for salvation. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Lord, we pray that you would show us these doors that are open, that you would show us too the doors that are shut. Help us to learn to pray doors open and not to open them by our own might and by our own power. Help us too to recognize when we need to leave in order to enter an open door elsewhere. Show us these things in our own personal lives and in our service in the church because you never leave us without an open door. It will either open where we are, or it will open somewhere else. In the Saviour's name, amen. Our last psalm is Psalm 24, on page 28, singing to the tune Irish. Psalm 24 at verse 7. And this is the open door. This is the door of the new Jerusalem opening above in heaven, welcoming in the Lord Jesus Christ when he fought the battle on the cross and when he was raised from the earth in resurrection. He was lifted up to ascension in heaven. And here are the gates of Jerusalem opening him opening to receive and and they'll open to receive us too. You ancient gates, lift up your heads, you doors be opened wide, 
so may the King of glory come forever to abide. Down to the end of the psalm, let's stand to sing to God's praise. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and remain with you now and forevermore.